Uh, Dr. Cedar will give the first talk on uh, compressive mediastinal masses. He's our chief of division of thoracic surgery at Rush. And take it away, Chris. Thank you. Well, I appreciate everybody being on this morning. Um, so, using the traditional three compartment classification, uh, anterior media, the anterior mediastinum. Uh, in red here contains lymph nodes, internal mammary vessels, and the thymus. And this is where we most commonly find compressive airway masses. Um, um, this is, you know, you get taught in medical school the five T's, thymomas, teratomas, thyroid goiters, torturous aorta, and terrible lymphoma. Um, and posterior to that, you have the middle mediastinum. It's bounded anteriorly and posteriorly by the pericardium. So it contains the pericardial contents uh, and po it's also bounded posteriorly by the membranous wall of the trachea. Uh, the intrathoracic trachea, the proximal main stem bronchi, the pericardium, the phrenic nerves and the heart, they are, they're all located within the mediast uh, middle mediastinum. You can get compressive uh, airway masses in the middle mediastinum because the airways run right through it. Um, Tumors of the posterior mediastinum, um, now these rarely cause airway compression um, because they are so far posterior. Um, these are primarily neurogenic tumors in, in uh, uh, generally um, schwannomas, ganglioneuromas, esophageal tumors. So I'm going to go through a number of different uh, tumors that can cause compressive airway symptoms and uh, we've gone through and resected uh, pretty much all of these, um, some in a minimally invasive fashion, some in a maximally invasive fashion, depending on what the patient needed. So if we start out with substernal goiters, we can take a look at this CT scan. This is a patient who has a really large goiter that extends you know, down past the aortic arch. Um, you can see that as you follow this tumor here, um, it connects to the thyroid and it's uh, um, you know, a large substernal goiter. This is the typical path that you'd generally see. Now, uh, Dr. Uh, Elkaderi will be talking about um, some of the um, cervical only approaches, but when it goes this far down uh, below the sternum, oftentimes you need to do a partial sternotomy. And so this here's a, a video of uh, a partial sternotomy that Dr. Elkaderi and I did together. Um, and a partial sternotomy is uh, just what it sounds like. Um, you go partway down through the manubrium and into the first part of the sternum, and you're able to open up just the top part of the, of the sternum. Um, and this is a, a less invasive way than performing a full sternotomy. Now, sometimes we do have to perform a full, full sternotomy. And these are closed in the exact same way as a regular sternotomy with surgical wire. Um, and uh, you know that's uh, a standard way to get to a large anterior mediastinal mass um, that is in just the superior portion of the anterior mediastinum. You can see that uh, although that looked like a big incision, when it's all closed up, we can take out relatively large masses that are underneath the sternum through through a reasonably small incision. Um, as we go on, go on looking at a, a variety of different types of anterior mediastinal masses, uh, this here is a tumor which extended much further down. Um, this patient <clears throat> was 50 some years old, and uh, although he didn't pr present with airway symptoms, uh, I bring this up to, uh, to illustrate the difference between a partial sternotomy and a full sternotomy. Now, this patient underwent a full sternotomy. And you can see here's a picture where, um, you know, it shows the entire sternum's open with some chest tubes underneath and, you know, requires seven or eight wires to close it up. The partial sternotomy is significantly smaller. Uh, that tumor that I just showed you, interestingly, was a mature teratoma. And, uh, you know, you hear of uh, all kinds of strange things that grow inside of teratomas, uh, teeth and hair, and um, it's all true. Uh, you can see here that this uh, this patient's tumor actually had hair on the inside of it, um, which is uh, quite interesting. Uh, this is a different mediastinal mass that we uh, that we recently resected. Now, this was an anaplastic thyroid cancer, um, and uh, you can see here 
that this extends not that far underneath the sternum itself, but it does involve the subclavian vessels. And we can uh, play through that one more time just to, to illustrate that. On the right, this is the tumor. You can see as you get down to the bottom of it, the subclavian vessels are abutting it. And uh, we were quite, you know, we were going to need to get access to that, uh, those vessels in order to um, resect this uh, tumor. And what we actually did there is uh, called a trapdoor incision. And you can see a picture of it here. It's a partial sternotomy, and the sternotomy is then carried uh, down into a thoracotomy. This is about the most maximally invasive procedure. You can see uh, we were able to resect that. We had to resect the uh, jugular vein. Um, you can see the carotid uh, as well as the trachea with the thyroid and the tumor uh, completely gone, clavicle here. And uh, this is also closed up uh, using surgical wire and it's like you would for any other sternotomy. But not everything we do is uh, that maximally invasive. You can, when This is a patient we just recently saw uh, that has uh, anterior mediastinal mass um, grow, growing in the uh, in this region here, um, this looked like it was pretty easily resectable in a minimally invasive fashion. And so, what I'm showing here is a video of a uh, minimally invasive thymectomy. Uh, this is done VATS. You can see the anterior mediastinal mass up here. This is the pericardium. The phrenic nerve is running right across the bottom here. We use a variety of devices, um, including uh, uh, energy devices. This is the ligature device, which works really nicely uh, to divide vessels and uh, help us dissect. But what we do is we take essentially all of the anterior mediastinal tissue off of the surrounding structures. Uh, the key thing here is just not injuring any of the uh, surrounding structures. You have the phrenic nerve, uh, you'll see in just a little bit, we have the innominate vein, which runs right through this field, um, as well as the mammary vessels uh, above and below. The sternum's right there. Uh, so what we're doing is dissecting the tissue between the heart or the pericardium and the uh, sternum. We've entered the uh, contralateral pleural space there. That allows us to kind of flip the tumor as well as the, uh, the fat into the other chest. And this gives us nice access to see the innominate vein. You can see here we're dissecting right on top of the innominate vein. You have these uh, thymic branches. These are thymic vein branches which come out into the thymus um, and right out of the innominate vein. These can usually be divided using, uh, using um, energy devices, as you'll see here. Now as we are finishing up the op operation, we freed up the uh, vein, uh, we take our as well as our thymus and place it into an endo bag, which can be then uh, extracted from the chest. And this patient had a, a cystic thymoma. So, you know, the range of uh, anterior mediastinal masses that we resect, um, you know, can require a sternotomy, an an a, a, a clamshell, a partial sternotomy, uh, but most commonly, uh, probably nine out of 10 times actually, they're resected with either uh, a VATS or a robotic approach. Now, midi middle mediastinal masses um, can, be, can prove to be uh, quite challenging as well. Now, we recently had a patient present to um, us as a transfer from an outside hospital with uh, an x-ray that looked like this. Uh, we got a CAT scan and you can see if you follow the trachea down here, there's this tumor that complete that's growing out of the right lung and nearly completely occludes the trachea. Um, and this is the esophagus here. So the trachea itself is, uh, is nearly occluded. And what we needed to do, our primary goal at this point was to preserve uh, uh, the uh, airway to the left lung. And so um, this patient will re require further treatment for the, the cancer that's in their right lung, but um, in the short term, we needed to preserve the airway to the left. 
So as we talked about earlier, uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation is a uh, technique that we often use. And we usually use venovenous. It does not require any uh, uh, anticoagulation. And we, um, you know, the, the machine is quite simple. It pumps the uh, unoxygenated blood out, oxygenates it, and then we put it back into their venous system so that if their airway does fill with blood as we're working on these tumors, uh, it's not a problem. So this is a, a rigid bronchoscope um, in a typical picture of how we uh, set this up. This is a video of you coming, of us coming down the uh, rigid bronchoscope, and you can see this tumor in the uh, right, it's coming right out of the right main stem um, and a relatively small opening. We debrided that tumor in the right main stem all the way back until our left main stem was open. Um, you can see there's a little bit of blood in this airway, but you wouldn't want to do this worrying about uh, bleeding. And we then deployed a stent into the left main stem bronchus. You can see that the upper and lower uh, lobe airways are open and the left main stem bronchus is now uh, at least open for the short term as the patient goes on to uh, radiation and other, other therapies. Uh, I think I just unshared. <clears throat> Well, let me reshare that. All right. So um, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, for uh, being here. Um, we'll have Dr. El Kaduri speak, and then um, I will, uh, and then we will answer questions as soon as uh, he's finished up. Thank you. Yes. Great. Thanks, everyone. I got the honor of giving the final talk. Um, and so we'll probably wrap up a little early and hopefully we'll show you, uh, you know, as, as you've seen with all these talks from my colleagues, um, just some really excellent videos, images, um, some interesting, fascinating talks. And I'm lucky to uh, work with such a great team. So thank you to everyone who's participated. Thank you to Dr. Cedar, who's really helped uh, kind of lead this whole meeting. <clears throat> Dr. Lipte and Dr. Stenson for supporting the idea and presenting us uh, with this idea of, uh, about eight, six months ago. So I get to, <clears throat> we've talked about thyroid lesions, we've talked about uh, working up nodules, um, some uh, ways and rationales to why we proceed with biopsies and, and surgeries. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about substernal thyroid goiters, which they're commonly referred. Uh, this is a um, probably the most extreme example of a, sub, of a substernal lesion um, with this mass extending all the way past the aortic arch to overlying the heart. This is a case that was managed by myself and Dr. Cedar uh, several years ago. I will say that this patient was particularly asymptomatic and this was picked up on imaging. But substernal thyroid lesions, I like to call them because I think goiter gives uh, the false sense of security that these are all benign. Um, and these lesions tend to grow, they distort the anatomy, they can have impacts on the surrounding vascular tissue, they can impact the laryngopharyngeal region and the tracheoesophageal region. There's really a spectrum of inferior extension. I think it becomes relevant once it's past the, the lesions are past the clavicle, and, and really just gotta keep in mind that the pathology is variable in these cases. So <clears throat> that was an example of a, a deep inferior extension. This is an example of a patient that had this palpable neck mass, um, and you can a, a little more prominent than you typically expect. And you can take a look at the CT scan, which shows a thyroid lesion starting from the submandibular gland, causing some deviation, mild compression there on the CT scan, and then some very mild extension, um, a very mild extension uh, just over the suprasternal area. But you can see that there's this vascular abnormality there. So the thyroid and the aberrant common carotid just kind of looping around. And then and this is really the goal of all thyroid surgeries to get to this point where you have the parathyroid tissue delineated, the inferior thyroid artery nicely delineated there, and then uh, the goiter uh, or lesion delivered. Um, and there's the recurrent laryngeal nerve being stimulated, and that's kind of the, where you want to get to with all your thyroid surgery if you made that decision to proceed with surgery. And so substernal uh, goiters, this is first removed in back in 1820. Um, there's been a variety of definitions all kind of depicted here. Um, 
but what's most interesting is that the most simple dis- decision uh, definition is probably the most effective. Um, is a study that uh, looked at a whole series of cases that were called substernal thyroid lesions, and depending on which definition you used, you can uh, say you have a 3% incidence of these lesions or up to 48%. The real thing is that the clinical de- de- definition should be adopted. Um, no one definition was uh, really better, per se. Um, and, you know, there are some definitions that may predict a sternotomy. And I think uh, many people think, when they think about these type of lesions, they're just thinking, do I have to do a sternotomy or not? And I think there's a lot more to consider. And the idea of doing a sternotomy for these lesions is actually quite rare. And so it shouldn't really define what the lesion is. Um, I think we should be, um, I think we're starting to get to the point of a better organized kind of idea of evaluating these patients. So in terms of these goiters, they, they occur about in one in 5,000. They, if you based on some early population studies, they were found about uh, one in five thousand of patients just based on chest X-ray. Of these lesions, one percent may be heterotopic, which means they just kind of originate in the mediastinum. Um, there's no clear connection coming uh, from the primary thyroid, and the blood supply that's feeding those is a little different. But we have to keep in mind that a natural history of a goiter is to grow, and then this eventually will lead to symptoms. Also. Uh, as Dr. Bayani had just depicted with his talk about ultrasounds and needle biopsies, well, depending on the location of these lesions, um, they may not be amenable to surveillance or monitoring uh, via the traditional routes. And historically, there was always considered to be a, a fair, uh, fairly high risk of occult cancer. Um, I think as we're reorganizing our understanding of thyroid cancer, some of that um, is changing. And here's an example of a lesion that... Um, does have a connection to the thyroid, but almost, uh, you can argue, may be heterotopic or clinically heterotopic when you are, are working on that uh, during uh, surgery. And so, what I taking a look at this scan, you see this large cervical goiter. There's obviously some impact on the airway. It is mildly deviated. There is some significant compression there, but... There's also a substernal portion, and you can argue that the substernal portion might not be the main cause of this patient's symptoms, and it's actually the large cervical component. So clinically, a lot of these goiters often are re- are connected with a large cervical component, and so it's important to look at the overall lesion. So here's an example of a 52-year-old gentleman with a BMI of 55 and severe obstructive sleep apnea uh, who came to our team for evaluation of um, this goiter and potential airway impacts. Um, this patient was having uh, frequent daily uh, symptoms, severe symptoms at night. And, you know, there's some mild compression of the trachea, mild deviation, but certainly on the mild spectrum. And when you take a look at this patient's airway, this was the laryngoscopy. So upon inspiration, you can see almost complete obstruction of their upper airway right at the level of the two cords. Uh, so this is redundancy here causing uh, excess tissue with obstruction and then here's the same patient after having a, a thyroidectomy and also here's the same patient this is a correct video same patient um after removal of this thyroid goiter as well as a uh, some mild kidney days are with my uh, with Dr. Hussein, and you can see a significant improvement in the airway. And that wasn't even very um, impressive on CT imaging in terms of uh, deviating impact in the airway. This is a patient who was 72 who was referred for what was thought to be a vocal cord paralysis and a large thyroid mass. Clinically, that makes us think of a aggressive cancer. And so this is the laryngoscopy exam, and I can understand why. Um, the physicians that evaluate them uh, were thinking there's a could be a vocal cord paralysis. And what you can see is there's this large obstruction at the posterior pharyngeal wall on the right side um, in the office after some you know, careful endoscopy, we were able to verify that the vocal cords in the upper airway actually was, was patent, but just being deviated. And so here's the CT scan of the same patient. And you can see right at this cut, there's a very large mass and is pushing and effacing the uh, pharynx and also has an extensive substernal component extending to the aortic arch 
But in this patient, believe it or not, denied having any significant symptoms. A lot of this was driven out of the concern from the uh, physicians she was seeing for, for, for a malignancy. And so here's the same patient in the OR. So we're delivering, we're able to deliver the lesion and we kind of get to this paratracheal space, identify the parathyroid glands of a current peripheral nerve. This can be done pretty atraumatically. And then you go on, um, identify the recurrent laryngeal nerve, use a nerve stimulator. Make it closer even. There's a variety of ways to stimulate the nerves. Um, there's continuous monitoring, there's uh, intermittent monitoring. And then this is kind of what you, with the end result, the trachea is back in the midline. This is uh, the vessels, great vessel on the left side and uh, you know just a significant improvement in the contents of the neck. And then you look at this patient's, um, this is the, the two sides of the goiter. And here's the scope exam. Here's a before and after. And you can see on the CT, marked improvement in the upper airway, pharynx, um, all the way down to the trachea. Essentially, everything is normal on this post-CT scan. And you can appreciate the difference on scope exam on the left and here's a post just a immediately improved appearance view now it's interesting because this patient denied having symptoms at first but after the surgery uh, you know noted that her swallowing and sleeping was much better but she did notice the change in her voice quality and it's probably related to the resonance and the impact of having that large uh, thyroid pressing on on the airway <clears throat> So symptoms, uh, this is actually one, one of the more interesting uh, aspects for me is that, you know, 50% of patients will note some dyspnea, 30% will note dysphagia, um, and rarely you'll identify vocal cord paralysis, and a few percent of patients will have pain. But really, this 20% of patients just were, can get picked up incidentally on imaging and deny any symptoms. And, um, and it seems to be not, it doesn't always seem to correlate with what we're seeing on imaging. So physical findings, you can have palpable mass, tenderness, voice changes, venous congestion, uh, trouble when they're raising their uh, hands above their head, uh, similar to a superior vena cava syndrome. And then here's an example of a patient with a, a BMI over 50, massive goiter, and you can see these changes on the upper chest, all consistent with venous um, congestion and backup. And you can see this is immediate post-op on the operating room table. and. Um, I can almost feel that this is improved immediately. And so you can imagine uh, over time um, the changes and improvements we can see in our patient's life. So, it, you know, sometimes you would see something like this on a CT and, and it may or may not be, cause significant symptoms. Um, um, but it's really important to look at the cervical portion of the goiter as well as the substernal portion. Um, and when assessing these patients clinically, uh, it seems to me that uh, the majority of these patients have an elevated BMI. Um, I will look at, you know, prior history of ACDF. This is an example of a patient of mine that has osteogenesis imperfecta, actually a 25-year-old um, female, um, and she had presented with this thyroid mass. And due to her, um, some of the congenital abnormalities she had, uh, you can see just having extension CT scans made a significant improvement in terms of uh, what we're planning and preparing for surgery. Uh, something like this may make you concerned due to our anatomy, uh, uh, you know, for the extent and exposure and approach. But with the flexion extension, you can see you get that much of a change where pretty confidently you can approach this without, you know, as much concern for a um, needing a, an extended approach or a, something other than a transcervical. Now, here's an example of a patient. I, I really like using the, the flexion extension CTs for these patients. Often, they come in with a CT of a chest that may, may identify one of these lesions. So here's an example of a 48-year-old gentleman who had this right thyroid lesion noted on a CTPE. And I'll just show you again how low that goes. And so counseling, this a very muscular um, you know, on, on the neck exam, you could appreciate some mild fullness, but extending pretty low just to the level of the aortic arch. But in the same patient, I ended up getting a CT neck with extension, 
And then you can see that this whole goiter is, you know, the majority of it is sitting above the clavicles and it actually, um, you know, lessens the concern. So some of the things we look on as imaging is the relevance or the location uh, related to the uh, aortic arch. Some people recommend the zagus vein or the um, different parts of the mediastinum. But the point is that with appropriate planning, um, this went from, uh, you know, having a Dr. Cedar on standby for a potential further approach to a procedure that we were able to to uh, approach um, as our common uh, thy traditional thyroidectomies. And so you also have to keep in mind, is this a malignant or aggressive process? This is a, a case that I was managing with one of our thoracic surgeons who presented with what on CT appearance suggested a substernal thyroid lesion, but they have a prior history of an ACDF and a prior history of a cabbage and on exam, this, this patient has a vocal cord paralysis. So um, we evaluate the portions of the thyroid that you can feel or see on ultrasound or for biopsy. And so this patient had a vocal cord paralysis, an FNA which showed a poorly differentiated process and a CT chest that was concerning for progression or malignancy. And so this picture was uh, uh, considered uh, anaplastic car carcinoma. And, but on the CT, it had an appearance similar to several of the other scans I've already showed you. And so thinking about airway and the symposium, we really uh, we see a lot of tracheal deviation from these lesions, and we see a lot of tracheal compression. We know that with um, increased compression, more narrow lumen, we see significant airway symptoms. Deviation is not well studied. Some uh, Most series suggest that there uh, you know, isn't a clear association with symptoms, but I think that, that these studies have not had uh, sophisticated testing, such as um, uh, spirometry, pre and post surgery, um, as uh, that would might tease out some of the details and changes that uh, and improvements we see, even for tracheal deviation. And so here's a 26 year old athlete who presented with pretty significant noisy breathing, uh, consistent with Strider, and uh, was trying to increase his activity level, and had this uh, finding on CT, mild extension just to the, to the sternum, pretty significant tracheal compression. So in the office, I, I often pass my scopes through the vocal cords to the, to the mid trachea. And so here's an example of this. So normal vocal cord motion, and just after 15 minutes of meeting this patient, I can immediately get a look at their trachea in the office. And so we'll pass through the cords here. We use some extra topical and we get a view and you can see this malleable kind of motion um, from the compression. And so here's the just the area of compression. You can see how it opens up. It is soft. So uh, this helps us when we talk with our anesthesia colleagues about how we're going to intubate and reassure them that this should be okay despite the CT findings. Um, and you can see here, just looking past the subglottis, you can see the narrowing right there distally. So the same patient, um, uh, muscular, which is important to keep in mind because um, if, if the uh, muscular attachments to the clavicle are broad and strong, similar from the strap muscles and, and any of the surrounding tissues, it's gonna be uh, difficult to get down deeper into the mediastinum through a cervical approach. So having a, a well-developed pectoralis muscle and these associated muscles can actually make it difficult to get deeper transcervically. Um, so this patient was intubated standard fashion, but I, uh, with our NIMS tube. And then this is the uh, goiter being delivered after just appropriate lateral inferior exposure. You can see it's right below the clavicle. Um, you can so you kind of manipulate the border. And after a lot of superficial dissection is done, and you can see this is the goiter coming out. Oh, wow. And so it's coming from the uh, posterior retropharyngeal area. You know, if this is all done with particular surgery, it can be done with relatively minimal blood loss in most cases. And so this is the left side of the goiter, of the thyroid. Um, these are the final path, and then this is the immediate next day CT scan. Um, you can see a pretty significant improvement in the airway. The patient, um, just uh, remarkable listening to his first comments after the surgery, just saying, wow, I, had, I didn't realize I was breathing through a straw for the last year. Um, and these are the type of rewarding cases um, 
it definitely um, can be with just the appropriate workup and planning um, can be treated safely. Um, and uh, so indications for surgery are generally substernal extension, mainly because these are associated with compressive symptoms, uh, but also because of we, the natural history is to grow. So over time, uh, for surveillance monitoring, it's going to likely get uh, harder over time. Younger patients, uh, given the natural history, and then concerns for cancer. And so I wanted to show you uh, just a couple cases here. I think I have a few more minutes. Um, so this is that large uh, lesion we uh, showed you, CT. This is the large goiter extending. Um, it does seem to have a connection to the uh, to the thyroid, but it extends all the way to the heart. And so this is the way we prep for this patient. If we're, if we're thinking that a patient is at, at real potential of requiring a sternotomy, we, we plan and prepare for it. I would say that that probably happens about 5 to 10% of cases, and the rate of actual sternotomy is about 1% to 2% at most. And so this is the exposure you can get transcervically. You can appreciate the patient's thyroid. You can palpate that, but you can't get anything further um, here. And, and, and so this is the sternotomy. With, uh, this is the case with myself, Dr. Cedar. And so there's the heart and the, the goiter is really extending here. Here's the primary thyroid up here. And so even in a case like this, I will have the discussion preoperatively and postoperatively about do you need a total thyroidectomy or do you need a partial thyroidectomy? And I will say we usually think of partial thyroidectomies as right or left, but I think of them as also mediastinal. And so in a case like this, um, this is all we removed and we've, we can easily monitor the, the residual thyroid if that ever needed to be treated surgically. Um, that could be done without an extensive approach like this. Um, and um, Given that you're preserving both thyroid lobes, it's unlikely that this patient would require thyroid medication in the long term. And you just need to have a, a strong team. So this is Dr. Cedar's uh, team and my team uh, working together on this large goiter several years ago. And so <clears throat> just going to jump into a couple uh, other lesions similarly. So this is an incidental lesion uh, picked up on an MRI uh, for the breast post mammogram. Workup was benign. Patient did have some cough and dysphagia. This is the CT scan. And so you can see a large process similar to that CT scan I showed you that was anaplastic and similar to the benign CT scan, significant deviation compression. In the OR. So we got the big goiter here. We got the thyroid. We showing the pterygeal nerve. And then, so then we further work on this goiter, and you'll see we mobilize the part that's extending low. While we're working, as we identified the recurrent nerve early, we did feel that we were dissecting pretty significantly on the nerve. There's a my finger pointing to it, and so intraoperatively, uh, just with dissection, we, sorry we identified that there's a change in the nerve signal. So no longer st stimulating distally, but right at its entry point it was. So that in conjunction with identifying that this, this goiter kind of was pretty mobilized, uh, we actually left the left and right thyroid lobe. Those have had prior ultrasounds and actually FNA or benign. And so we removed this medius, the, the substernal portion, and she did have a vocal cord weakness um, immediately after surgery for about six weeks. And then here is the vocal cords fully recovered uh, within two months. And so she re uh, reported improved symptoms. Um, her incision healed quite well. She's not requiring a thyroid replacement. And um, this incidental finding was treated, uh, uh, I think, favorably. But a similar case in terms of CT imaging that we've seen of a woman that had recently had an open biopsy found to be anaplastic thyroid cancer. Pretty extensive. Okay. And on this side. She had normal vocal cord There's the nerve here. Okay. And now, this is the cricoid here. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 
almost 12, 13 kilo rings down there. So, you, so in the right the patient, anomaly, you can see beating. The right patient, you can get pretty extensive exposure transcervically without needing to do anything extended, but this is an aggressive pathology. This is the type of surgery this woman um, required. These are the nerves. This is the airway, and here's the thyroid mass. Final pathology was anaplastic cancer, and this is her uh, four years later. Definitely has some cosmetic changes in the neck, but she has a pretty functional voice um, and is currently five years without disease. And just to finish it off with another more aggressive pathology in this area, a 51-year-old gentleman who had a uh, recently aborted thyroid surgery, um, there was found to be what was thought to be a benign goiter was uh, ended up intraoperatively to be found to be papillary and the case was aborted and um, patient was referred to a tertiary center. So this is the patient's uh, laryngoscopy upon us meeting. There is now a vocal cord paresis, which uh, he states started after the surgery. And then on evaluation under the glottis, you get a glance into the upper trachea and on this picture, you can see this subtle abnormality in the right subglottis. And so um, thinking about the way we're going to approach this patient, we got a CT scan. This is after the hematoma um, and the outside surgery. And so you can see right here, there's abnormal planes, similar to some of the scans Dr. Stenson had showed us this morning with concern for tracheal invasion. And so this went from a patient who was having surgery for a benign goiter to an invasive papillary thyroid cancer of a tracheal involvement. And so uh, this is the operating room. Uh, first thing we did is took a look at his airway and we could identify that irregularity we identified, we saw in the office, biopsied this and it was found to be uh, papillary thyroid cancer. And this is the surgery with uh, Dr. Cedar and myself. Um, so right here we have the trachea, multiple rings. You can see there's obvious erosion of the uh, area at the subglottis from the cricoid to the upper trachea. This is the tumor. This is the resection. And so given that he already had a vocal cord paralysis at an elevated BMI, and a, um, we, we did perform a cricotracheal resection. I did do a small distal tracheostomy. Um, this was also associated with a bilateral neck dissection. And so um, we decannulated him about a week and a half post-op. But you can see this is the airway immediately after. So going in through the trachea, looking at the subglottis from below, you can see our anastomosis well healed. And you can see that the we were able to preserve function in that uh, only fo uh, functioning vocal cord. And so, okay. and then final pathology revealed invasive thyroid cancer. This patient went on to receive radioactive iodine, um, no other treatments, and currently being monitored about two years post-treatment. So in conclusion, I'd say that uh, thyroid lesions with substernal extension can be managed safely in a majority of cases. Majority are benign, but aggressive pathology does occur. Appropriate planning and patient counseling is necessary for successful management and having a team approach for the complex lesions, uh, whether it be our other colleagues in ENT for upper airway variations uh, or diagnosis or with the thoracic colleagues for removal and, uh, and definitive surgery. Um, a team approach allows for excellent outcomes in these patients. Thank you to everyone attending, and thank you for um, your time. Thanks very much, uh, Chris and Samer. Those were fantastic talks to wrap up our conference. Uh, we have just a few questions that came in through the chat and was hoping to get your guys' thoughts on it. Uh, the first of these is for uh, Dr. al Qadari. And it had asked, you know, when you have larger tumors, uh, is there any uh, techniques or, or uh, parameters you use preoperatively to suggest whether you're going to have an airway?